Nom Nom delivers fresh food with whole ingredients, backed by veterinarian science. Science tells us that a dog's health starts in the bowl, so improving their diet is one of the best ways to help them live a long and happy life. Nom Nom's food is full of proteins your dog loves and the vitamins and nutrients they need to thrive. All you have to do is order, pour, and serve. Ready to make the switch to fresh? Order Nom Nom today. Go to https colon slash slash trinom.com forward slash curveball and get 50% off your first order plus free shipping. That's https colon slash slash T-R-Y-N-O-M dot com forward slash curveball. Plus, Nom Nom comes with a money back guarantee. If your dog's tail isn't wagging within 30 days, Nom Nom will refund your first order. No fillers, no nonsense, just Nom Nom. Welcome to the Living the Dream podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. achieve, achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, I am joined by Daniel Daniel Magler. Daniel is a school social worker, a therapist, and private practice. He is the host of the mental health podcast, Not Allowed to Die, and he is also the mental health advisor to the nonprofit organization, Pause for Patrick. This is an organization that connects young people with mental health issues to emotional support animals. So we're going to be talking to him about his story and why this topic is so passionate to him. So Daniel, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much. It's really exciting to be here and to be able to share a little bit about Pause for Patrick with your audience. Well, why don't you start off by telling everybody a little bit about yourself? All right. Well, again, as I said, I'm a school social worker and therapist in private practice, and I used to coach lacrosse. I'm a father and two little boys, 12 and uh, nine, and uh, live in the Chicago area with my wife and my dog, Mariska, who you can hear maybe licking her paws in the background. Um, And I just have had the great opportunity to find the perfect career for me. Working as a school social worker and working um, with young people, they give you the greatest gift that someone can give you, which is their trust. And in my capacity doing that, um, I got to meet a young man named Patrick Romer. And Patrick and I worked together from his freshman year into his senior year. And during that time, Patrick was struggling with depression, anxiety, and lots of things. And traditional therapy just didn't work for him. He had a very hard time opening up. And I'm sure some of the people who listen to this may identify with that feeling, that it's just hard to talk about the things that you've gone through and the things that have happened. But the one thing that he could always count on was his dog. And he loved Cece. And she was just on a hard day. All he wanted to do was get home from school and be with her. And unfortunately, on the first day of his senior year of high school, uh, Cece died. She was only six years old. And so that year, he just, he had been, um, he'd had a really good junior year of high school. His sophomore year, he had to go to a therapeutic boarding school and a wilderness program to try to deal with some of the ways his depression manifested and his anxiety manifested as sort of acting out. But again, as I say, his junior year was good. And then with Cece dying, he just, he never really fully recovered from that. And we knew, I knew that there were secrets inside that Patrick did not want to share, but he was determined to never be sent away again. And he was going to wait probably until he turned 18. Unfortunately, um, this was his senior year was the year that COVID happened. And during the second semester of his senior year, he was no longer coming to school. I didn't get a chance to see him anymore in person. And I tried to stay in touch with him via email. And for him, the pandemic was actually a bit of a blessing for him and his family. They had really good times connecting with one another. Patrick organized the Pet Olympics where he and his family and their cats and dogs and all that, they just hung out and did little tricks to see who would get the treat first and whatnot. But then he had one really bad day and he died by suicide in May of 2020. 
And as a therapist and social worker, there's really nothing that's more devastating than losing one of your clients to suicide. And a GoFundMe was set up in the community where I work to help support the family. And then he said, you know, we don't really need this money. We want to do something that will help other people. So his parents and his sister and his brother, they thought, we want to do something to get what Patrick would want, mental health support through animals. And so they formed Paws for Patrick. And so what happens with Paws for Patrick is, and they asked me to come along and be the mental health advisor, is people who might need the, or benefit from an emotional support animal can go to the website, pawsforpatrick.org, and they get assigned a wish grantor who is kind of a case manager and who talks to them and finds out what they need, whether they need help figuring out what kind of animal could benefit them, or if they need to get a letter from a therapist that allows them to have an emotional support animal in their apartment or their dorm room. And then that person works with them to help get them the support that they need. And I am also a volunteer therapist who writes emotional support animal letters for it. So we've been up and running since August of 2020. And I've personally written um, over 85 emotional support animal letters in them. So that's uh, a bit of me in a nutshell. Sorry if I just went on for a, rambling for a while there. No, you, you, you're doing great. And, and that was great information for the listeners. So explain to the listeners what a, an emotional support animal is, first thing, and how it is different from a therapy dog. Yeah. So an emotional support animal is any animal that being near it, it reduces some symptoms of a mental health disorder. So for, for people with anxiety, depression, OCD, bipolar disorder, if a person, an emotional support animal, people often think of dogs and cats, but it could be a hamster. It could be a fish. It could be, you know, a tarantula. It's anything that just being near it helps a person to feel a reduction in their symptoms. And so for a lot of people, loneliness is such a devastating thing. The Surgeon General has gone around the country talking about the, that devastating impact. And so just to be able to come home and to know that there's this creature there waiting for you, that you can help take care of, that you can spend time with, that's an emotional support animal. Now, a therapy dog is a animal that's gone through extensive training to be non-reactive. So one of my former um, students, she just texted me the other day that her dog has finally been approved to be a therapy dog. And she had to take him to multiple outings to places like Home Depot and whatnot and show that he was non-reactive to people, to other dogs, and that he's going to never be aggressive in any situation. And so at Poster Patrick, we actually have a team of therapy dog handlers that go out and bring dogs to young people who can't have their own dogs at home. But that's localized to just the Lake County, Illinois area, where that's where kind of where we're headquartered out of. So we don't have that all over the country, whereas we do help people all over the country in acquiring emotional support animals. Some people are also they confuse emotional support animals with service animals. So like a service dog, a person with a disability like blindness may have a service dog that helps them get around and be more ambulatory and negotiate their spaces. Um, so a service dog has the highest level of training. The level of training for a service animal usually costs about ten to $15,000 to get. And a service animal is trained for a specific disorder. There are psychiatric service animals so that when a person's having an anxiety attack, that animal might be trained to lick the person's face or do some specific task. But an emotional support animal doesn't need any specific training to be that. It just allows you to have it in your home. And if you have a letter that says you can have an emotional support animal, you're not allowed to be, you're, the, your landlord can't charge you pet fees for having that animal. Well, talk about what is contributing to the, the uh, mental health crisis for young people today and how can we help support them in this time? You know, I think we are victims of our own success in that what we want to give everyone is choices, but choices can be stressful. It's one of the reasons why I think uh, Trader Joe's is so popular in that they don't have as many kinds of chips or kinds of crackers or anything. There's just a smaller amount of things. And so each kid grows up today thinking, gosh, there are so many options in front of me. What am I supposed to choose? And with that, there's the fear of choosing wrong. And with social media and things like that today, there's this constant comparison. And they say comparison is the thief of joy. And I couldn't agree with that more. So what we can do for each kid is help them understand that there is no failure or success as a destination. That every day they wake up and if they are putting good out into the world, if they're doing something that's personally resonant for them, that they're being a success that day. And that's all any of us try to do. So often, and again, social media contributes to this, we try to posture as if we have it all figured out. 
And the more that we can be open about our struggles and reduce the stigma and say, none of us have figured this all out. Each one of us is just doing the best they can every day. And there are a million different ways to be positive, to be successful. We give them the opportunity that they can possibly do that too. But so many kids feel like they're not going to be able to achieve what their parents achieved or what society is expecting them. And again, that's why animals are such a powerful gift because your cat, your dog, your pot-bellied pig, it doesn't care what clothes you wear. It doesn't care how many followers you have on which social media account. Your animal just loves you no matter how you look and what you feel. So that's why, again, think, encouraging young people, some people are not animal people and that's totally fine, but everybody needs to be a person who takes a break from just being inside, gets outside and connects and has relationships. And that's what we want to encourage people to do. So pause for Patrick. What what are the age ranges in case there are any listeners that want to use your service and, and apply for an emotional support animal to tell us, you know, how that works in the age ranges? Yeah. So we say we're for young people and we define young people as people 26 and younger. But also, let's say you're a person and you're 57, but you have and you deal with anxiety, depression, something else like that, but you're raising three young people, then Pastor Patrick would also say, well, we're helping the young people in your home. So the oldest young person that we've ever helped was 88, and uh, we helped her to get a dog. So anybody who's hearing this, if you're not sure, go ahead and go to our website and apply. Because at Pastor Patrick, we have a policy where we don't really say no, but we might say not yet, where we're, we're prioritizing that, that group that's 26 and younger. And in addition to that wish grantor who will help you acquire or figure out what animal is right for you, Foster Patrick can provide up to $500 to help acquire an animal. So if there are adoption fees from like um, an agency where you want to adopt from, Foster Patrick might be able to help pay those for you. And if you need some basic obedience training for an animal to make sure, let's say you're going to have a dog in your apartment that it won't bark too much, Foster Patrick at this point can offer up to $750 to help support training. So anybody, if whether they're sure or not, they should go to the website and fill out the application. Now, some people will say, well, I've never been diagnosed with anything. If you're a person who has symptoms of anxiety, symptoms of depression, and you're hearing this and you're thinking, well, then the wish grantor would connect you with one of our volunteer therapists like me, who would do an assessment with you and say, okay, in my clinical judgment, you either do qualify for an ultra support animal or you don't. And that level of qualification isn't terribly high. As a professional, legally, all I have to believe is that, like in my clinical judgment, that you do have a disability that could be improved upon by having contact with an animal. And those letters, they should theoretically not expire, although some landlords will ask for an updated letter every couple of years. But as long as your anxiety doesn't expire, theoretically, your letter shouldn't expire either. Well, since you mentioned the website that the listeners can go to and, and, and apply, uh, go ahead and give it out. It's just pauseforpatrick.org. So, and uh, again, you'll see a green icon, lots of pictures of Patrick himself on there. And we're also on Facebook, on Instagram. So you should be able to find us on any of those spots. And just so listeners know, pause is, is like dog pause. Yeah, dog pause, P-A-W-S. Yeah. Got it. Okay, so talk about how What's the environment like in, in high school for queer and transgender students and how can we support them? Well, that, a lot of my work day to day is with um, queer and I, I run uh, support groups at the school. I run groups for um, LGBTQIA students. I run groups for kids with disability, uh, like medical issues. I run groups for kids who have um, social skills issues, uh, trauma survivors and whatnot. But so much of my work is with the queer students and particularly the transgender students. And currently in our political climate, there is a lot of legislation that's being created. And there's a lot of debate and talk about transgen transgender athletes. And there are a lot of people who would generally be supportive of queer people, but they'll say, yeah, but I'm not really sure about athletes, you know, competing, whatnot. And I guess the vast, I would say 95 to 99% of the kids that I work with are not athletes who are trying to do anything. But every time one of these bills comes out, it makes them feel like there's a whole group of people who hate them. And what I can tell you, no matter what you believe about why a person would be transgender, these are kids who are just struggling to survive. And the suicide rate is so much higher among transgender youth. People worry about 
bathrooms and things like that. But there has never been a documented case of anyone being attacked by a trans person in a bathroom. Yet we have tons and tons of cases of people being attracted, uh, attacked by cisgender people in bathrooms. So it's all a bit of a red herring. And what we need to let these people know is that it's okay to be whoever you are. It's okay to figure yourself out over time. That it doesn't need to be anybody's business what kind of genitals are in someone's pants. That we just care that you get through high school and that you are supported and you grow up to figure yourself out in your own time. And so it's been a very, very challenging time. And I think anybody who has questions, again, if anybody wants to email me at D-M-A-I-G-L-E-R-L-C-S-W at gmail.com about just even questions of how do I deal with these new pronouns and things like that? You know, I'm happy to answer those kind of things because the words and the language is constantly changing. And that's okay. It's okay to feel confused. It's okay to feel weird about using they, them when you're only talking about one person. But as long as you remember that attached, these aren't just buzzwords for politics. There's a real human life attached to each one of these issues. And I have dealt with so many kids who feel like giving up, who feel like dying just because they feel like the world will never accept them. And what we want to encourage them, and that's on my podcast, Not Allowed to Die. The reason it's called that is because I say to my clients, you can do whatever it takes to get you through this world. You're just not allowed to die. And that's what I'm encouraging, especially these young people. There is something called the It Gets Better Project, where celebrities and other people make videos to tell queer youth that just get through high school. Life will get better. And a lot of the people making these videos aren't even queer. They just had a hard time themselves during that high school time of life. So that's what we need. The message that we all need to be sharing with our LGBTQ and particularly the trans kids is, hang on, things will get easier. Things will get better over time. Well, let's talk about male socialization. In your bio, you say that male socialization leads to violence. So tell us about that and, and how can we attract well-meaning men to care and act on this situation? Yeah, my first job out of college was doing violence prevention programming in Chicago public schools for kids who've been kicked out of regular Chicago public schools. And we taught about male socialization, and it was based on the work of Paul Kivel from the Oakland Men's Project. And when Paul Kivel, he was doing drug treatment, and he found that in this drug treatment, a lot of times as men were giving up, uh, they were no longer taking drugs, as opposed to becoming less violent, some of them were becoming more violent. And he realized the drugs were not causing the violence. For many people, they were self-medicating using drugs. The real issue was men not knowing how to deal with their emotions, their feelings, and us teaching men that the only emotions they were allowed to have are joy and anger. And that anger often needed to be expressed through dominance and control. So what we need to do is we need to teach all of our boys that they can have the full spectrum of emotions, that our emotions are tools. They're just like our feelings, that the reason we have pain is to tell us, oh, something's going wrong here. And that's the same reason we have anger. Anger is there to tell us that something needs to change. But anxiety or sadness, these aren't weak feelings. These are things to tell you about your environment. So step one is we need everyone to question, question themselves and say, whenever I'm feeling something that I don't like, what is my body trying to tell me right now? Then we need to teach everyone how to support people who see the world that's a little bit differently than they do. And finally, how to interrupt violence when it's safe to do so. In our society, one in three women will be subjected to intimate partner violence. And they say one in five young women before the age of 20 will experience sexual assault in some form. But only one in 28 men will either be a domestic violence abuser or will sexually assault anyone. So what we have is 27 out of 28 men who are innocent, who are not doing anything wrong, and yet they are not seeing this as their problem, even though they have sisters, they have cousins, they have daughters, they have nieces. And what we need to do is we need to get that 27 out of 28 well-meaning men to say, this is my issue. This is my problem because I care about women. And one of the ways that as a man, if they want to be a protector of women, all they have to do is start having these conversations with other men and saying, you know, like rape's not okay. And instead of taking the side of people who are sexually assaulting people and saying, oh, well, he was probably framed or you know what, whatnot. We need to say, hey, I wasn't in that room. I don't know what happened, but I know mo most people don't make this up. I remember I had been doing this work for over 10 years when I sent a message out to all my friends 
saying, hey, please just don't send me any more emails with jokes about rape um, or sexual violence. And I was nervous when I sent that email out thinking, gosh, what are all my friends going to think of me? Are they going to think I'm just too sensitive or whatnot? And the vast majority of my friends responded really positively. It was funny, the one friend who responded negatively and teased me about it, and it was just gentle teasing, but he himself was a sexual assault survivor. He had been molested by his cousin as a child. And it's something that I think I'm the only friend that he's ever told that about too. But notice that it's that male socialization that he needed to use humor to cover up for the fact that this is something that had happened to him. So as men, we need to say, like, I remember watching the movie Lincoln and thinking, gosh, it, it really helps you to see that getting rid of slavery at the time when we, our country was fighting against that, they thought, well, maybe we'll never get rid of slavery. That's been around for thousands of years. But enough people got together and said, no, we don't, just because we've done this all throughout history doesn't mean we have to keep doing it. And I think the same thing can be true for sexual assault and intimate partner violence, that we can eliminate them and we can eliminate them in our lifetime. If 27 out of 28 well-meaning men start really thinking about this and talking to each other about it, and most importantly, talking to our young men about it, we are doing a better job as a society teaching about consent and saying no means no. But consent is only the beginning. What we really need, what I'm trying to teach my sons is not to look for consent in their sexual partners, but instead to look for enthusiasm. There are a number of young men who may have sexually assaulted people without even realizing it because they took silence for consent. You know, they might have said, hey, is this okay if I do this? And if the, the person, the romantic partner they were with didn't respond, they thought, okay, I guess she's cool with it. And sometimes, particularly people who have been sexually traumatized in the past may freeze up. We know we get those four apps where during a stressful situation, fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. And that last one, fawn, is just, you know, to kind of, to almost make an alliance, make a deal with someone. So when people are really stressed, they may do any of these things. And a well-meaning young man might think, gosh, I didn't, I didn't want to sexually assault someone. Well, were you looking for consent or were you looking for enthusiasm? Because if you're really getting enthusiasm from your partner, you know, you're going to know that. So again, that's what I want to teach my son. And I think that's what we should all be trying to encourage. And if the person, if you're afraid, I remember being a young man and thinking, gosh, I want to move while this, we're in a moment right now, we're having a connection and I didn't want to stop the momentum. And the point is, if you can't stop the momentum of that night, and if, if the momentum was interrupted, if you wouldn't decide to have sex anyway, well, chances are that wasn't the right thing to do. If you couldn't come back to it the next day and still want to have sex with each other, then probably that was one that was better off avoided. So again, it's a thought process that we need to share. And, and we can really be sex positive. So sometimes people think that when we are trying to prevent sexual assault, that we're being sex negative. But the best sex is consensual and it's enthusiastic. So that's all we want is for people to have great sex and great sex is not sexual assault. So we can be positive about sex and be preventing rapes at the same time. Okay, so I know that you have the unfortunate experience of losing one of your clients to suicide. So talk about what the experience is like for a therapist to lose either a client or a family member to suicide. Yeah, I say, obviously, as I mentioned, I lost Patrick in May of 2020. And then I lost my nephew in uh, January of 2021. Um, my nephew was 26 years old and he ended up taking his own life. And then uh, in the fall of... Um, 2022, I lost another former student uh, to suicide. And I think for anyone, when we deal with any grief, we deal with, you know, questioning. So the first, the, the stages of grief, denial, bargaining, depression, anger, and then eventually hopefully acceptance. And we don't go through these, like, you know, the stages, like the hands on a clock, we feel them all in waves at different times. But when you are that, so that bargaining stage is, is kind of a questioning of self, of saying, and, and this is even if a grandparent dies, we think, oh, I should have spent more time with Nana. I should have done these other things. But when you are a therapist and when, when your client dies by suicide, there is a sense of failure that I really let this person down in the most profound way possible. They were counting on me. The family was counting on me to be able to see the danger and to help them through it. And that is unrealistic. And I was fortunate enough when I was uh, working at a hospital to a grand rounds 
where a speaker came through and talked to all the psychiatrists and the therapists and whatnot. And he said, if you're doing the really important work in mental health, you will eventually lose a client to suicide. And I was a young, in my early twenties, when I heard that, and I thought, oh gosh, I hope not me, but yes, it has come for me. And it's wrestling with that idea of, is this my fault? But then every time that comes up, I try to say to myself, if I make it about me, then I would have to be also making everyone's success about me. And when people get better, I don't think, well, they only got better because I was their therapist. And so if I'm not going to take credit for everyone's gains, I also can't take blame for everyone's struggles. And whether that's suicide or whether that's a relapse from you know drugs or from self-injury or any other addictive behavior, that I am just part of these people's story. I am not the story. That being said, for myself, I ended up getting a tattoo um, for Patrick. Uh, the logo of our organization is uh, a paw that he had spray painted on a bridge um, after CC died. He went out and um, made a really cool looking piece of artwork there. And that became the logo for our organization, Paws for Patrick. And for my nephew, he and my brother were big on uh, restoring cars and then a 1970 Chevelle. And so on my forearm, my other forearm, I got a tattoo of the Chevelle that they used to work on. And when the other student died in the fall, um, he was a deep thinker and he and I always had amazing conversations. And so I got a tattoo of the thinker on my right bicep. And I'm not encouraging everyone to do that and say, everyone doesn't need to get a tattoo when someone dies. But for me, I never want to stop thinking about these people. I want to think about them every day, not just as the loss of what I've given up, but I want to remember their life and how they inspired me. And to this day, for Patrick, for my nephew, for the other young man, I don't see my work with them as a failure. I don't see my love for them as a failure. I don't see them as failures. They are all success stories. And just like we wouldn't think that a person who died at 26 from cancer, that that life had been for, in vain or for, take it for granted. I also don't see my, my nephew had a battle with mental health issues that we did not know he was facing. And that's so frequently people think, well, you're, you're going to see signs. In the case of my, my nephew, he wasn't any, any kind of treatment that the family was aware of for mental health. It's just, again, in his case, substances were involved in the decision and very frequently when people die by suicide, they are under the influence, but not always. And so we can't always see it coming. And only recently in my work for Pastor Patrick, have I found out that the term suicide prevention actually can be considered somewhat offensive by the families of people who have died by suicide, because it implies that every suicide could be prevented. And if we don't prevent them, that we're failing instead of realizing that every person has a story and some stories end differently. And it doesn't mean that that person wasn't loved and cared for and every family member around them wasn't doing all that they could. So we like to try and my work, I try to prevent every death that I can. I try to promote as much health as I can, but I've moved away from saying suicide prevention and instead saying mental health awareness is what we're trying to promote. Okay. So let's talk about volunteering. How, how can volunteering help those who are struggling with mental health issues? Well, I, again, I, I guess for me also, the volunteering has been what my work with Pastor Patrick has been incredibly life affirming for me. And I think it's been so healing for me in recovering from Patrick's death and saying, I could take that pain and I could put it into something positive. Because when we're dealing with a death, especially a death by suicide, often we feel so helpless and we want to take the energy and take the, the wisdom that we hopefully gain and do something with it. And I think that for every person who is, depression particularly makes us look inward and it makes us very self-absorbed. Um, and so what volunteering does is it, it shifts the focus from inward to outward, and it helps people to feel like they can be positive and productive. So just like in having animals and caring for an animal, so many people who I'm writing emotional support animal letters will say, you know, taking care of my cat, taking care of my dog makes me feel like I am responsible and I am important. And it gives me a reason to do something. Well, again, even if you don't want to volunteer with animals, if you volunteer with teens, if you volunteer with um, people who are homeless, if you go to a hospital and um, help just guide people to rooms, any volunteer work that you can do can help you to deal with your mental health struggles by making you think, gosh, my life could be harder in some other different way. And no matter what's going wrong for me, I can be a, put a positive influence out into the world. So 
I think volunteering is something that it's what I do. For, so for so many of my clients, I really highly encourage them. And it also helps people to build social networks. We know that loneliness can be devastating. And it's the biggest factor in increasing mental health challenges. So if you're volunteering, whether it's on an environmental campaign or just helping, helping to sell tickets for a raffle to help re replace the old clock in the center of town, you're going to meet other people who also care about that. And you're going to build yourself in a social network. And we know that people do better when they've got other people they can call on and connect with. So you say in your bio that, that self-entry is misunderstood. Explain that. Yeah. I mean, so many people I have, uh, I just was uh, emailing back and forth with uh, one of my former students, and she's brilliant, and she's uh, in graduate school for uh, theological studies, and she does campus ministry. And it's summertime, and it's hot, and she wants to go out and wear shorts, but she has self-injury marks all over her legs from when she was younger. And so many people, when they see self-injury, they think, oh my gosh, that person's crazy. Like, Who would actually cut themselves to deal with their problems? And they don't realize that self-injury is just a coping skill. It's an unhealthy coping skill, but what it does is it takes a person's pain and it makes it concrete and manageable. For so many people who self-injure, they'll have a, a sense of restlessness and discomfort. They may have negative intrusive thoughts that they can't stop flowing into their brain. And when they injure, it's kind of like taking the air out of a balloon. Often they can just rest. And when they injure, like I, or most of us who don't self-injure, if we cut our skin or we burned ourselves or we did any of these things that people with self-injury issues do, we would feel tremendous pain while we were doing it. But for people for whom self-injury becomes a habit, the process of during the injury, they're not feeling any pain while they're doing it. They're often, and they may look up after having done it and they're like, oh my gosh, I, that was 16 cuts on my arm or whatnot. So, because they're not feeling it in the process. Then after they, you know, bandage it up and put their neosporin on and things. And it's a couple of weeks later and people see all the injury marks. They're thinking, oh my gosh, that person is not sharing the same reality. They're out of their mind. When these are often very rational people who are just experiencing too much emotion and they don't know how else to cope. And by engaging in the injury, it gives them a sense of control, relaxation. Different people injure for different reasons, just like people do everything for different reasons. Some people like to see the injury marks because again, it it, it takes that emotional pain that doesn't feel very real and turns it into something that they can see. Other people hate seeing the marks. They don't want to see blood. They don't want to see any of that. So that part can be different. But what we should understand, if we want to help people with self-injury, instead of condemning them or being angry with them for injuring, just realizing that it's just, to me, self-injury is not inherently dangerous any more than smoking marijuana. In fact, if a person was to cope with their feelings by drinking alcohol or if they were coped by self-injury, drinking alcohol is actually a much more dangerous way of coping with your emotions because pretty much anything can happen. Alcohol is kind of a wild card. It's a mood amplifier. So whatever mood we're feeling, if we're happy and we drink alcohol, we might feel more happy. But if we've got feelings of depression behind that and we drink alcohol, we might it becomes more intense. Whereas self-injury tends to just make people rest. But when people see it, they mistakenly often think that self-injury is a suicide attempt. So while there are people who self-injure who might also make a suicide attempt by slitting their wrists or whatnot, the vast majority of times when people are self-injuring, it's more, it is just a coping skill. Similar to a person purging after, if they eat food and they, they're feeling overly full, they're feeling gross, they may purge. Some of those same people who purge, they may purge even when they're just feeling stressed. They're feeling a lot of anxiety. They, it isn't even related necessarily to the food. They've just stumbled upon a coping skill that works for them. And then in engaging in that behavior, it helps them to feel more relaxed. So I know that you kind of touched on your podcast earlier, but you know, let, let listeners know where they can find it and what they can expect when they listen. Yeah. So Not Allowed to Die is a mental health podcast where I kind of pull back the curtain about what is a therapist's perspective is on mental health. And I have different guests on my podcast where we talk about whether um, it might be um, a different forms of therapy, like eye motion desensitization, uh, like EMDR type therapy, or I might have an acupuncture expert on there. So anything that I'm curious about of how does this actually work, then I might have guests on to talk about that. And my interview podcasts are also posted on YouTube, but you can find the podcast Not Allowed to Die uh, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere. And on the episodes where I don't have guests, I'll just talk about different dilemmas that I'm seeing with the clients in my practice. So I might say, 
okay, I was talking to three different clients this week who were dealing with breakups. And so it might be a podcast talking about breakups and how to get through them. So <laughs> for many years, people would tell me, you should really write a book because I have a lot of analogies and ways of coping that I talk about with my clients over and over again. And I realized, gosh, a lot of people don't like to read books, but more people might consume a podcast. So if people have questions, I encourage them to write in and email me. And then I just, I talk about things and give a little bit of perspective from that other side, from what it's like from my chair and how to assess that and how to get people to more treatment and help. Tell us about any current or upcoming projects that you're working on that we need to know about. Yeah, I mean, the main thing is just everything that I'm doing with Pause for Patrick. Our goal is that, you know, five years from now, when you say mental health and animals, people are going to think Pause for Patrick. And so we want to grow and we want to spread the word so that nobody has to be alone with their anxiety, with their depression, when they could potentially be with an animal. So that's the main thing that I'm developing. The podcast has been ongoing for a couple of years and it will continue to go. But my passion and my encouragement for people to check out is truly with Pause for Patrick. Because, you know, no matter how good a person's therapist is, they can't be there at three in the morning, but their dog, their cat, their fish, they can be there for them. And if we can bring a little light and joy into people's life, that's something that we really want to do. Well, throw out your contact. I, I know pauseforpatrick.org. Do you have any more other websites or any other contact information? No, you can just, again, check out the Not Allowed to Die podcast and check that out wherever you find podcasts. And uh, you, people who have questions for me directly, whether it's about helping support trans kids, whether it's about animals, can email me at d-m-a-i-g-l-e-r-l-c-s-w at gmail.com. Okay, close us out with some final thoughts. Maybe if there was something I forgot to touch on that you would like to talk about it, just any final thoughts you have for the listeners. Just that every one of you who's listening to this can have a profound impact on the lives of others. You probably already are. So give yourself credit for that and help connect people to other resources. You hearing this, you may you know, bring it up in a conversation with someone that that might really transform someone's life. So take that opportunity and that responsibility you, everybody listening to you are a profound part of change in people's life. You are a reason for other people to have hope. So share that hope with other people. And again, maximize your time with animals because it's good for you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, pause for patrick.org. Be sure to check it out. If you know of anybody that could benefit from an emotional support animal, give them the website, share this episode. Also, please be sure to follow, rate, review, if you have any guests or suggestion topics, see Jackson 102 at Cox.net is the place to send them. As always, thank you for listening. And Daniel, thank you for joining us today and sharing all that you do and sharing your expertise. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream. dream.